All right, so we're going to be talking about the exemplar of benign prostatic hyperplasia, or BPH for short. Go ahead and get out a blank exemplar worksheet, turn to page 1531 in your Davis book, and please study along with me today. So let's just start with what is BPH? Well, a benign prostatic hyperplasia is an enlarged, big, boggy prostate. Now the prostate is a walnut-sized gland that lives and sits just below the bladder in a male. And from about age 25 on, the testosterone-based hormone DHT tells that prostate to keep growing and growing and growing. And that prostate will continue to grow throughout a man's life. And so you can imagine that the biggest risk factor for a big broggy, boggy prostate is advanced age in a male. Older men are going to have higher risk for BPH. So what you'll see here on this slide is what flows right through this donut shaped walnut sized prostate. Well, it's the urethra. And so urine has to flow and pass through the prostate out of the urethra out of the penis. And what happens with these big boggy prostates is that it impinges or squeezes around the urethra. And so urine is not able to flow freely through that urethra, causing things like urinary retention, urinary incontinence, and urinary frequency. Why? Because urine can't pass through the urethra. It's, an, it's a urinary obstruction issue at its core. So we know the greatest risk factor for BPH is older men. In fact, 90% of older men by the age of 80 are going to have BPH. So even if it's not why your patient is in the hospital, it may very well likely be a problem that your patient has. So we understand that this big broggy prostate that just keeps growing throughout a man's life is going to squeeze and pinch off that urethra so that urine can't flow from the bladder out through the urethra to pass. And so we're gonna see problems with elimination that come from urinary obstruction. Things like difficulty starting the flow, a weak urine stream, multiple interruptions during urination, dribbling once urination is already complete. Why? Because the bladder didn't really fully empty in the first place. We can see things like urinary free urgency, a, a sense to go right now, urinary frequency, voiding often. Why? Again, because that bladder never fully emptied. We can see nocturia, awakening multiple times at night to void, and a bladder obstruction outlet, meaning the, the uh, organs of the urinary system can be impacted. Things like the bladder itself can get injured as it expands and grows to try to accommodate all of this extra urine. Or we can see ascending issues as the pressure builds up and can pro cause problems even into the kidneys like an acute kidney injury. Now, in addition to these signs and symptoms, there are some other diagnostics and lab works we can do to confirm BPH. The provider uh, can do a digital rectal examination, putting a gloved finger up through the anus to actually physically feel that big boggy prostate. We can look at a urine analysis and what we're looking for are signs and symptoms of infection. Why? Because when that bladder is full of urine that can't be eliminated because the urethra is all squeezed off by that big boggy prostate, that urine just hangs out in the bladder. And you know that bacteria love to grow and fester in old urine. So we can look for signs of infection in the urinalysis. We can also look at the PSA, prostate specific antigen. It's a blood test and it actually indicates cancer of the prostate. But the PSA will also be elevated when there is a presence of an infection, like a UTI. Now, treatment for BPH is going to vary by the patient, and there's going to be different um, uh, treatments based for mild, moderate, or severe cases of BPH. And treatment usually starts with watchful waiting. In other words, telling the patient um, if, the, if the signs and symptoms aren't impacting their life, if they're not getting up multiple times at night, they're not having frequent UTIs, dribbling, we may just watchfully wait and actively survey the patient, have them check in once a year at the clinic uh, to make sure the signs aren't getting worse. We can also counsel the patient to avoid tranquilizers and decongestants, which can make the um, urinary obstruction worse. 
your Davis text has a really nice um, flow sheet of how patients are treated for BPH depending on the severity of their symptoms. So you can pause this here and go to your text or look at the screen to review this for yourself. Now I wanna talk about two different drug classes and one over-the-counter herbal supplement that can be used as part of the treatment plan for BPH. The first part of those, the first drug category is alpha adrenergic, alpha adrenergic blockers, such as tamsulosin or doxazosin. They all end in osin. They're smooth muscle relaxants. And so they're gonna relax that prostate so that urine can flow more freely and not be obstructed. Uh, but they take about two to four weeks to work. We're not gonna see the effects immediately. The problem is it's a smooth muscle relaxant, which means it's gonna relax all of the smooth muscles in the body. So everything is gonna be nice and relaxed, which can cause problems like dizziness, drowsiness, or orthostatic hypotension. It can also cause retrograde ejaculation, where uh, when the patient ejaculates, the semen actually goes up into the bladder rather than out through the urethral os. The second drug category is the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. Tried to say that 10 times fast. Two examples of that are finasteride and dutasteride all those asteroids, um, they actually in stop the production of DHT, that testosterone-based um, hormone that tells the prostate to keep growing. So if you stop the hormone that tells it to keep growing, it won't keep growing. Uh, now this one takes a long time to work, for three to six months. And there's some side effects, both good and bad. On the good side, they actually have shown that these medications can have a reduction in male pat pat patterned baldness, so that's a bonus. But on the flip side, they can have some negative effects, such as gynecomastia, meaning enlarged breast tissue, or decreased libido. Now, between the orthostatic hyper hypotension, the gynecomastia, decreased libido, we've got some pretty significant adverse effects for these drugs. So these aren't things that we're going to want to keep patients on for the long term. But there is another option on the market, and I linked a, a, an article down here from the American Academy of Family Practice Physicians, who's noted that this herbal therapy, saw palmetto specifically, actually has a similar effect to the prescription medications with less side effects, no drug interfer interactions, and it's less expensive. So win-win. The side effects that there are happen to be very mild and very rare. So saw, saw palmetto is an, a nice herbal option to get patients with BPH a nice effect. Now there are four surgical procedures that I wanna to touch on. Now the most common procedure for BPH is a TERP, a transurethral resection of the prostate. So what happens with a TERP is the uh, provider, the surgeon actually goes up with a scope through the urethral os up into the urethra and scrapes away the inside of that big broggy prostate, leaving just the shell of the prostate left. And you'll see if that shell is left open, then urine can freely pass from the bladder through the urethra and out without any obstruction. That's the most common uh, uh, procedure we're gonna see. Symptoms are pretty easy to tolerate after the procedure. Patients are put on light activity right away. We often keep, keep a catheter in for three to five days, looking for signs and symptoms of infection or bleeding. Um, and we should see the patients having a stronger flow of urine pretty much right away. The other uh, non-invasive procedure here is that transurethral incision of prostate, where instead of scraping away the inside of the prostate, the surgeon only makes two incisions. Um, it's also minimally invasive. The scope goes up through the urethra. And this would be for more mild to moderate cases of BPH, where it just helps release some of that pressure of the prostate around the urethra. Now, an open prostatectomy is done about 200,000 times each year, where the uh, surgeon makes an incision in the lower abdomen and actually opens up the abdomen to visualize the prostate directly. Now, this is done if patients have had any kind of complications like bladder stones or injuries to the bladder that may make the, the procedure more complicated. The final procedure on your list here is a laser surgery where the surgeon goes in with a laser and actually burns away 
parts of that prosthetic tissue and it will not grow back. Again, relieving pressure around the urethra so urine can flow. Remember, the whole goal here is to allow urine to flow and to stop that obstruction of the prostate. So let's walk through the nursing process as we think about BPH. When we're assessing, we're going to look for the signs and symptoms of, of urinary retention um, and, and problems with urinary obstruction. Those are the things we're looking for. And when we're diagnosing, we're going to be thinking about problems with sleep patterns from that nocturia or even risk for infection from the urinary retention that causes bladder irritation and infections to grow. Now, when we're thinking about our interventions, first, we're going to take action with our assessments, thinking about those urinary signs and symptoms, dysuria, bleed, hematuria, bleeding, um, freak, urinary frequency, nocturia, all those things we learned about back in fundamentals. We're going to assess their temperature because if someone has a UTI, they're going to have an elevated temperature. We're going to do a focused abdominal assessment. Is their abdomen soft, non-tender, non-distended? We can do a bladder scan, a little wand that we put up to the patient's skin on their lower abdomen after they void. And when we hold that up, the um, bladder scanner will tell us how many mLs, how many milliliters of urine are left in the bladder. Now in a healthy person with a normal urinary flow, that should be less than 200 mLs post void. Anything more than that shows a bladder retention that not all of the urine is being voided freely and easily. And of course, we can look at those urinalysis, um, again, indicating if the patient has an infection. So some actions we can take is sometimes we're going to need to pass a catheter. Um, we can do a Foley catheter, but sometimes that big boggy prostate can be really hard to pass that Foley catheter through the urethra as you get to that obstruction. Now there's a special kind of Foley catheter called a coude catheter that has a firmer tip on the end of it that helps to just give a little more leverage as you're passing that through. But if you're starting to notice bleeding, significant pain, unable to pass that um, catheter, you can get a urologist, or a, um, a physician who specializes in the urinary tract to come in and have them perform the catheter. So never force um, a catheter if it's just not going. Get, get some help, get someone else to do it. And then as you're thinking about catheterization, remember your sterile technique and how you manage those um, Foley catheters, doing good peri care, um, emptying that regularly, checking for kinks, all those things that we need to do when we're considering good catheterization nursing care. And then of course, we're gonna administer any medications as ordered. Now, what are we going to teach our patients? Well, remember, we're teaching that watchful waiting. Tell them to alert us if any of their symptoms are becoming more distressing or interfering with their daily life. Um, teaching them to decrease liquids in the evening so that they aren't getting up as frequently at night. Educating them about the medications, why they use them, what they're for, and when to take them. When they should seek follow-up what their surgical options are if it comes to that, and then teaching good aseptic care if they have any sutures or incisions post-surgery to prevent them from getting any infections. Now, what are we looking for? What's our evaluation? How do we know if we've met our goal with these patients with BPH? Well, what we should see is less urinary retention. We should see a strong, easy flow of urine and decreased nocturia, decreased waking up to void at night. Those, these goals here are gonna tell us we're making a difference with this patient with BPH. Now, the last part of your exemplar worksheet talks about identifying complications. If you would, look with me on page 1532 of your text at that table 661 in the upper left corner. It's going to list some of the most common complications of BPH and why this benign issue can actually become problematic. It talks about things like um, kidney stones, which we're going to talk about this week. It talks about urinary retention, which can cause bladder injury, acute kidney injury, as that pressure builds up and bacteria climbs up into the kidneys. Um, we can see kidney damage, bladder damage, kidney stones, UTIs, 
and acute urinary retention. These are the complications we're looking for. And we've talked a lot about these things already, the UTIs, the urinary retention, um, urinary incontinence are concepts we've all learned as part of our concept of elimination. So make sure you review that part of your concept study guide. That's gonna do it for our lecture on BPH. Can't wait to apply this, uh, put it into practice and dive deeper with this in class.